and how we thank him and praise him that he loves us. It was the northernmost part of the country, the mountainous area. They were on retreat, a time of rest, vacation. A conversation casually broke out. He simply asked, who do you think I am? And they talked about that. And then Simon Peter broke into the casualness of the time with words that probably surprised him. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're right, Peter, and you didn't learn that from anyone. Only God teaches that to people. And I say to you that you are Petra, you're Peter, little rock, a pebble, the word means. And I will build upon this rock, Petra, substantial foundation rock, upon the rock of what you have just said, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Church. Christ's way to batter down the gates of hell and rescue all of us from its clutches. Church. The body of Christ. He is the head of the church. Church. The bride of Christ. He loves church. It is his bride. It is his wife. It is his partner in life and in ministry and what's going on in this world. Every time Christ has something to say to us in the Word of God, he says it through church. The letters in the Bible are written to church. Even the general epistles are written to churches in an area. When Christ would say something to the people of Asia Minor, he addressed seven dictated word-for-word -word letters to seven local identifiable churches. He loves church. Church is important to him. It is his bride, his partner, in ministry and in life. He is hurt when we in the church are casual in our Christianity. He is pained when our commitment is less than total. He is crushed when we don't love him like we should. And conversely, he is thrilled when our Christianity commitment is real and total. He is ecstatic when we are faithful. And when we love him, he loves us back with many, many a love gift and brings us all the fruit of the love and joy and peace and goodness and all of those things that he loves to give to his people. Church. New Testament makes it very clear that church is not building. Church is not building at all. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, he says, my people are my temple. To the Corinthians, he wrote, don't you know, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. Therefore, glorify your body, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. You are his temple. You are his church. Church is important to him, important to him. And I pray then that today's topic is important to you. What's a church to do? Why are we church? Why has God put us here? Why has he given us a gathering place on a day called the Lord's Day where we can come and honor him? Why are we church? What's a church to do? When Henry Ward Beecher was a young preacher, he preached and nothing happened. Lives were not changed. People were not saved. 
the church was not flourishing. And one day he said, there must be a reason why when the apostles preached, something happened. And if there is a reason, I will find that reason and will change my life. And it did change his life. I think an even greater reason. Because church is you individually. Because church is you collectively. I think there is a, a better question. And that is to say, there must be a reason why when the first century church met, things happened. And if there is a reason, we will find that reason and let it change us. I know you don't come to church on the Lord's Day morning to be told you ought to come back on the Lord's Day night. But I want to ask you to do that. I want to ask you to come back tonight and Wednesday nights and all the Lord's Day nights and Wednesday nights of January and February and I'd like for us to open the book of Acts and learn from that what the church was when Christ was its real Lord in its early days and see what we should be as church. And on these Lord's Day mornings for I don't know how long, we're going to be talking about what the mission of the church is. For several months, I've been praying, Lord, what is the mission of a church? What's a church to do? If we state why we exist and why we're here, what is the answer to that? What statement can be made to say, this is who we are and this is what we do and this defines us as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? The words are found on the front of your worship folder. They are not inspired of God's Holy Spirit like the Bible is. They are not inerrant. They are not infallible. But they are what I believe with my soul. That we can glean from God's Word to say, if you want to ask us why we exist as church, this is it. We will love God. We will love each other. We will learn and obey the Word of God. And we will commit our lives, our talents, our resources to the task of telling as many people as we can about the love of God in Christ Jesus. This, I believe, is why we exist as church. We will love God. What is the greatest commandment? When you ask the Lord Christ, what's the most important thing? When we read the Old Testament, what is the first thing God taught his people? What is that thing that Genesis 6, 5 says you will write on the tablets of your heart and you will write it on the doorpost of your home and you will see it when you go out and you will see it when you come in? These, he said, are the words I want you to have as a part of your life. What is that statement? That's right. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And consistently, every time someone asked Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment? Never one time did he fail to say anything other than this, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The thing God wants most from you is your love. To a very snidey young television interviewer in Dayton, Ohio, years ago, who asked the question, what does God want from us out at that football stadium? One of the greatest entertainers of all time said, honey, God doesn't need a thing you have. He just wants to tell you that he loves you. That's all. That's all. We're here to love him. Remember when Simon Peter 
on the night of Jesus' arrest, this brave, bold, strong, undisputed leader of the apostles wilted and became a coward and said, I don't know him, I never heard of him. And then they met face to face. Jesus and Simon Peter met. What did our Lord say to him? You coward. You substandard sinner. No, you remember what he said. Three times he asked, do you love me? Do you love me? Is it not then too far-fetched for us to think that when we fall flat on our face, when we sin, when we fail him, that when we come into his presence, the first thing he asks with a loving heart is, do you still love me? Do you still love me? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. What do you think is the worst sin anyone can commit? What do you think is the most hideous sin that anyone can commit on the face of this earth? What is it? Well, does it not follow that the worst sin is the failure to obey the greatest commandment? That the worst thing you can do is to disobey what God says is the greatest thing you can do? The worst sin is to fail to love him. The worst sin is to not love God. In Romans, the apostle is making a case for a statement that will sum up three chapters when later on he will say, for everyone, me, you, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the first chapter, he is building the foundation for that statement, demonstrating that all have sinned against God. And here is the bedrock statement as he begins for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is to be praised forever. Their sin, what caused it all to tumble in? What's caused the tragedy of this world, the collection of all of our sins? They quit worshiping and loving the Creator and they began to worship and love things that are simply created. Tell me, who do you love most? What do you love most? The greatest sin you and I can commit is to not love God. Our mission, we will love God. And we will love each other. Remember the second part of that command is this. You will love your neighbor as you love yourself. In John 13, 34, and 35, crucial time just before the arrest, just before Christ is to be crucified, after three and a half years of being with these men, they spend that last night arguing about who is greater. Power posturing trying to claim leadership in the kingdom that they think they understand, but they don't because he will say, my kingdom is a kingdom where not the most powerful, not the most assertive, but the one who is servant shall be great. If you would be great, you must serve and love. But they were arguing about who was great. So our Lord Jesus came in and he washed and toweled their feet. And he talked to them about being servants. And he said to them, 
a new command I give to you, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you have love one for another. And just a little later in the same conversation in John 15, in verse 12, this I command you, love one another. As I have loved you, you love each other. In verse 17, again he says, this is my command, love one another. He is saying, if it is your goal to let the world know that I am who I say I am, if you would tell the world that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, then he said, this will be the indisputable evidence that you love each other, love one another. In this way, he said, people will know that I am the Son of God. Love one another. And it's in, all the, it's in all the scriptures. In all these letters to the churches, you'll find it there again. Remember how in the church at Corinth, here's a church that Paul says lacked in no gift. They had all the spiritual gifts, but they were not spiritual. You can do that, you know. You can have spiritual gifts and not be spiritual. And they argued about who was great, and they argued about what gift made another gift, and they had devised ways to say, here are the spiritual ones, and here are the unspiritual ones. And the apostle addressed that. And in the middle of this thorny discussion, as he tried to love and reclaim the faith and grace and fellowship of that church, he wrote these familiar words. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Or if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. To the Christian church in Ephesus, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in God Christ forgave you. A new command, he said, love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples and that you have love one for another. We will love God. We will love each other. And we will learn and obey the word of of God. What is your truth source? Where do you go to make your decisions? How do you decide what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, how to live and how not to live, what is priority and what is unimportant? Where do you go to get your information to make those decisions? The truth source for Christians is the Word of God. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the apostle tells that young man, do your best to be acceptable to God, to present yourself to God in that way. How? By learning how to discern what is in the Word of God. In one psalm, let me read just seven statements about the Word. How can a young man keep his way pure? 
by living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. And in John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, said Jesus, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. We will learn and obey the Word of God. Now, if these things are the mission of the church, if this is why we exist, we will love God, we will love each other, we will learn and obey the Word of God, then these things could be better done in heaven. Isn't that true? These things could be much easier done, much better done, much more wonderfully done in heaven than on this earth, in this climate, and in this kind of culture. But why are we here? Wouldn't it really be best, it seems, if we were here just for Christianity to save us and help us? Wouldn't it be better that the minute we accept Christ as Savior to immediately be taken to heaven and get out of this stuff? These three things could have been done better in heaven than on earth. But there is another reason to exist as church. We will commit our lives, our talents, our resources to the task of telling as many as we can of the love of God in Christ Jesus. You remember when Jesus walked the earth, he made it clear that he understood his mission. He said, I have come down here to find, to seek, and to save those who are lost, those my father lost. I'm looking for my father's lost sheep. I want them back. He loves them and wants them back. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. As soon as he came out of the grave, he met with his apostles in John 20, and he said this to them, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. The mandate, Go ye therefore and make disciples in all nations, baptize them, teach them to observe the things that I have taught you to obey. Acts 1.8, just before his ascension, But you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me. This is what we're about. This is why we're here. The poet said, Oh, what regret will then be mine when I meet my Lord divine if I've wasted all the talents he doth lend. If no one to me can say, Friend, I'm glad you came my way, for it was you who told me of the sinner's friend. Why do we exist? What is our mission? We will love God. We will love each other. We will learn and obey the Word of God. And we will commit our lives, our talents, our resources to the task of telling as many as we can about the love of God in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for the greatest reason on the face of the earth to live. And Lord, help us be your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to the time of inviting you to the fellowship of this church and to join us in our mission. We want you to know you're welcome and you're wanted. In just a moment, we're going to all stand, and I'm going to ask you who would just to walk forward and tell us in what way you want to honor our Lord God, professing your faith in Christ, joining this church, 
rededication of life, indicating a call to a particular task in kingdom service, whatever it is, share it with us, and we'll be glad to hear it. Let's stand quietly and reverently, and you come just now.